Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February edition of the Southeast Climate Monthly Webinar, where we talk about the climate and special topics pertaining to the Southeast region. I'm Sandra Rain, the Regional Climatologist from the Southeast Regional Climate Center, and I will be giving a climate overview. Our speakers today are Jeff Dober from the Southeast River Forecast Center, who will provide a water resources overview, Pam Knox from the University of Georgia, who will give an agricultural impact update, and our special topic speakers, Karen Gleason from the National Centers for Environmental Information, who will review the climate of 2020, and Kelsey Satellino from NIDIS, who will give an overview of drought.gov and the new tools there. We thank them all for joining us. Just a reminder to type your questions and comments in the question box at any time, and they will be answered at the end. Also, a recap email of this webinar will be sent out with a YouTube link to this recording. Okay, let's get into the climate of the Southeast. Looking at the past 30 days, the temperature across the Southeast was near average, where mean temperatures were within about two degrees of average for most of the area. We see a similar temperature pattern with Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, where for the month of January, they were near average. Precipitation was more variable across the region for the past 30 days, with eastern North Carolina seeing slightly above average precipitation and most of Alabama and Florida seeing below average precipitation. For Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, it was a drier January, with below average precipitation reported across the area. Now, something we don't often think about for the winter time is severe weather, but during mid-January, the Deep South tends to see a tornado risk. The typical wintertime severe weather setup includes a fairly strong low pressure system that tracks eastward across the Southeast region with warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico streaming into the area ahead of a strong cold front. This type of severe weather setup happened on January 25th where an EF3 tornado tore through the city of Fultondale, Alabama. This tornado had winds estimated at 150 miles per hour. It did substantial damage to a residential area and threw debris considerable distances. Unfortunately, there were 30 injuries and one fatality reported with this tornado. Other winter weather includes snowfall. We've even seen a few inches across parts of Alabama and Northern Georgia this winter, but overall it has been mostly near average snowfall across the region. We haven't seen any major Southeast snowstorms. And that's partly due to the La Nina pattern this season, which tends to keep the Southeast warmer and drier. But as David mentioned the past two months, it has been a more of an atypical La Nina pattern with drier areas over Tennessee and the Mississippi Valley and more wet across to eastern North Carolina and Virginia. But this is probably due to the blocking patterns that set up at the beginning of the season. And we might see a transition to more typical La Nina pattern a little bit later this winter season and into spring. We are currently under a La Nina advisory with a 95% chance of it continuing through March and a possible transition to neutral during the spring and summer, which hopefully will happen so we don't dry out too much during the spring season. The current drought monitor shows continuing drought across the western half of the nation and, and very little drought across the eastern half of the United States. Closer to home, throughout the month, abnormally dry conditions have expanded in coverage and pockets of moderate drought have developed in Alabama and Puerto Rico. So for the spring outlook through April, we expect drought development across the southern portion of the region, including all of Florida and the northern portion of Puerto Rico. 
As far as temperatures, there's about a 40 to 50% probability of seeing above average temperatures for the southeast and a higher probability of seeing below average precipitation across the southern portion of the region with equal chances of above or below average precipitation as we go northward. Over the next six to 10 days, however, we see a greater probability of below average temperatures to the north of the region and a small probability of above average temperatures in southern Florida, with about a 40 to 50% probability of above average precipitation across the entire region. So just to sum up, uh, basically it's been near average temperatures for the past 30 days, variable precipitation. There was a strong EF3 tornado in Alabama. We are under a La Nina advisory. And the next six to 10 days, it will continue to be an active pattern. And spring should be warm with the southern part uh, dry. Um, I'd also like to note that the Southeast Regional Climate Center's website is currently under construction. So if you need to reach out to us, please contact us through the email listed, Twitter, or Facebook. Um, you can also just friend us anyways, too. Um, all right, so now I will pass it over to Jeff, who would talk about water resources. Okay, thank you, Sandra. So to start off here, uh, we see the map on the left there of the southeast region, and we're looking at above normal stream flows across most of the North Carolina, southern Virginia area, as well as coastal South Carolina. And now we're seeing some below normal scattered uh, below normal stream flow across Alabama and into Georgia. But for the most part, we're looking at re, uh, regionally, for the most part, we're looking at near normal stream flows across most of, the, most of the Southeast. Part of this is that we are in this period of our primary recharge period. Uh, so you can see the graph on the right there, that's for the South, uh, the, uh, South Atlantic Gulf region. So as you can see, what was well above normal in the fall, these same stream flows are now normal because we're heading into this primary recharge period where the normals are higher values. So volume wise, as far as the streams, we're about the same. We're just going into our wetter time period. You can go on to the next slide. And this gives you, uh, you know, a little bit of insight. The, the, the map on the left here is from early December. And then the map on the right here is from February. So again, this gives you that perspective. What we're stream flows that we're seeing now back in early December were actually above normal to well above normal for most of the areas. Now we have had some drying, uh, as uh, Sandra pointed out, across portions of the southeast. Uh, but for the most part, uh, volume-wise, stream flows are relatively the same as we had back in the fall. We can go on to the next slide. So as far as flooding conditions across the region, we're still seeing scattered, uh, basically minor flooding in many of our larger coastal rivers across the, the coastal areas of Georgia and the Carolinas. Uh, and this is from just repeated cooler weather and repeated rainfall events, a lot of light to moderate rainfall events that we've seen over the last month. And it's just been wet in this area really since uh, even since the late summer. Next slide. And this is not out of the ordinary. We're in week six. This is the, the regional river flood climatology, looking back at uh, river floods from 1975 through 2019 across 103 select forecast points in our area and our region. And you can see we're in week six, and so we're ramping up to uh, what is typically our, our primary flood season, our primary recharge period season. Uh, and that sort of peaks here in the next several weeks. And then uh, uh, usually by late March, we'll start to be on, in early April, we'll start to be on the decline. Uh, but uh, right now, minor flooding is not out of the ordinary. It's pretty typical this time of year. Next slide. So as far as the forecast for February, as Sandra pointed out, uh, uh, we're expecting cooler and, and, and a chance for wetter conditions across 
a good portion of the, the region. And so we're going to continue with the current trends here for the February stream flow forecast, which is above normal across uh, North Carolina, Southern Virginia, and, and down some of those larger river systems that go into the coastal South Carolina. Uh, we're going to continue to see above normal conditions, uh, stream flows for those air for those rivers, but then uh, probably closer to near normal uh, across Georgia and Alabama as well as Florida. Now, as far as the forecast as we go into March and April, that'll be slightly different. And as Sandra pointed out, we're expecting something more along the lines of La Nina with warmer temperatures and maybe some drier conditions. So uh, right now we're we're thinking that uh, toward the back end of that primary recharge period, what we'll start to see stream flows continue to to uh, be in that normal range or continue to decline into the normal range as those drier trends uh, prevail in late spring and um, and with along with the warmer temperatures. So that is the forecast for February, March, and in the April. Just in summary, again, stream flows remain above normal across the Carolinas and near normal for Florida and Georgia, with near normal to below normal across Alabama. And as far as our forecast, it's more of the same for February, but trending to near normal across the entire Southeast by May, March, and April. And that's all I had from the Southeast River Forecast Center. Now I'll go ahead and pa pass it off to Pam. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Pam Knox. I'm the director of the UGA Weather Network and an agricultural climatologist at the University of Georgia. Um, it's not a real busy time of year. Farmers are busy right now planting their, starting to prepare their fields. They're not quite planting yet because it's been a little too cold, but there are a few things we need to look at for agriculture. Uh, you've seen these maps already from Sandra, so I'm not going to spend a long time on them. The departure from normal, you can see it's been warmer than usual sort of in the in the western part of the region and and cooler than normal in the eastern part a lot of that has to do with how cloudy it's been if you break it down by um, daytime temperatures versus nighttime temperatures the daytime temperatures have been quite a bit cooler than normal because of all the clouds but the nighttime temperatures are actually running above normal in a lot of the region um, so we have seen frost of course but uh, it could have been a lot worse and so that's something that we're looking at Rainfall for most of the region uh, over the last 30 days has been fairly dry, except for this the storm track, which has persisted um, through parts of uh, South Georgia and then on up to the Northeast into the Carolinas and Virginia. Um, there is still a small region of D1 in Alabama. I don't think that's gonna last too long. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So we can move on to the next slide. There we go. There's a lot on here. Um, the map shows the 90 day departures from normal for rainfall, and you can see exactly how wet it's been in especially Eastern North Carolina and Virginia, and then also down into South Carolina. And this is usually the time of year when farmers are busy out in the fields. They're preparing um, the ground for when it gets warmer so they can actually do planting in a lot of those areas. And so they really had to cut back because if you try to drive a heavy tractor onto wet soil, it really compacts the ground and it makes it much harder um, for the soils to be ready for the, for the plants. Uh, but there is some planting going on, especially down in the more coastal plains. Right now, there's a lot of strawberries going in and vegetables as well. Um, that, those wet conditions have caused some problems. You can see on the lower left there, there's a picture of strawberry with rod on it. Um, they're starting to see some of that in the plants that have already developed fruit. And uh, the plants as a whole are really showing a lot of uh, problems with the, the fungal diseases from the wet conditions. Um, so not only are they having delays doing the prep work in the fields, but they're also seeing some problems in the vegetables that are already planted. Another, another problem from those wet conditions is that the pastures in those areas are so wet that really the plants are getting drowned out and they're not growing very well. And so there's a lot of hay, hay feeding that's going on. Of course, this is the end of the winter season. So the farmers are really interested in getting their animals back and having fresh grass. And if the pastures are not responding, that means they have to put out more hay, which is expensive. Um, and so, you know, hoping that that will dry out and become more like a typical La Nina winter uh, for the rest of the season, we'll see. I thought it was interesting that um, several farmers 
noted that the deer are going crazy eating the strawberry plants. They've run out of a lot of other food. And so they're going into these fields and you can see the bottom picture there just shows what happens after the deer go after those strawberry plants. Um, so they're trying to come up with innovative ways to keep the deer out, either putting up temporary fences or, or other ways to keep the deer out. Um, I don't spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in South Florida. Of course, there they can grow all year because they don't really have a lot of freezing temperatures, but they have noticed some problems with wind and the big temperature swings that we've been having, weakening some of the seedlings. And so those have been somewhat affected by the weather as well. So all those things are going on. Uh, other areas with the drier conditions, especially farmers are getting it ready as fast as they can for the growing season because we don't know when that's gonna start. Let's go on to the next slide. One of the big questions I often get this time of year is about the chill hours. And this is for Peach County, which is just near Macon, a little bit southwest of Macon, um, named for a good reason because there's a lot of peaches there. And so the, this just shows the chill hours that have accumulated there sort of as a marker for the uh, center part of Georgia. Um, we can see that over the last month or two, we have overtaken the, the slow development of chill hours from last year. Last year is in green. This year is in red. The long-term average is in gold. And I don't think we're going to make that this year. Uh, you know, the temperature is warming up, so it's getting harder and harder to make those, those long-term averages. If you're interested in another area, the, the website down on the bottom will show you a way to uh, get to a map or you can pick the station that's closest to you. So the chill hours are doing pretty well. I think most plants have had enough chill hours. Most varieties have had enough chill hours so that they're about ready to go. And I talked to the peach specialist who is in Peach County, uh, Jeff Cook, and he said, the buds are already swelling. They are ready to go. Um, so they're really worried now about having any warm spells um, that would bring the plants out of dormancy anytime soon because the likelihood that we're gonna see another frost is pretty high and I'll show the frost maps in just a minute. Um, so if we have a warm spell, of course, we're supposed to have a warm spell here in Georgia over the next few days, um, the plants, could break dormancy and then they would really become a lot more vulnerable to frost. I asked him how many days in a row they had to have of above normal temperatures. And he says, they're really not sure about that. It depends certainly on, partly on the variety um, and exactly how warm it is. But uh, here in Georgia, we're gonna be missed by a lot of the cold air that's expected in the, in the, la in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's gonna be colder to the West in Alabama. It's gonna be colder in the, um, Carolinas and Virginia, because we've got this cold air damming that's coming down the east side of the Appalachians. And Georgia and Florida are probably going to be missed by a lot of the really coldest air. And so they may continue to see fairly warm conditions, which is not always good for the, for the peaches and the blueberries, things that are blooming. So we go on. To the, yeah, there we go. Um, it's the time of year when we start to think about when is the last frost. And this is a out of three maps from agroclimate.org, which shows um, different percentages. And I find this a little hard to understand. So I wrote here on each of them. Um, on the left-hand side, it shows the set of maps. So in 10% of the years, the last frost will occur after this date. Um, the middle one is sort of the average frost date. 50% uh, of the years, the last frost will occur on or after this date. And the dates there are color-coded by the key at the bottom left. And then at the right, 90% of the years, the last frost will occur after this date. And this particular week happens to be yellow in the coding. So it's the first part of February. Um, so you can see that um, in 90% in of years, the last frost will occur after this week in large parts of uh, South Georgia and uh, the coastal Carolinas and uh, also parts of South Alabama. And so we're not by any stretch of the imagination out of the frost period yet. I don't think it's going to be one of those years where we have a really warm um, start to the growing season and we don't go back into frost considering how up and down the temperatures have been this year. And so this is something that we're really watching for carefully. We hope that in, in this case, we kind of hope that it doesn't stay warm for too long in the peach growing and blueberry growing areas, because if it does and the, they come out of dormancy, then those blooms are gonna be very vulnerable to frost. Uh, so we're watching that very carefully. Um, you know, it's, it's been this dance back and forth of the cold air trying to push in and never quite making it through 
uh, to the southern parts of the region. And that's not that unusual for it to happen. This year has been a little colder than usual. And so um, really have been watching that carefully. So if we go on to the next slide. Some of the threats to agriculture in the coming weeks we're expecting to see. We've got these continued cold outbreaks. They're gonna accumulate more chill hours. Well, we're almost to the point where we don't need more chill hours, but it will slow down the plant growth and keep the blooms from coming out too early. If it does get warm for several days, we could start to see those trees starting to bloom and especially the early varieties. And so that's a concern for us. Uh, we do notice that in the weeks three to four period, uh, they are predicting a return to La Nina conditions. Now they, they were a month ago too. Um, some of that is based kind of on, on typical La Nina conditions because the models don't do real well at three to four weeks. And so we'll have to see if that continue, if that is likely to be true or not. Uh, a lot of the, the polar vortex shifting has been due to a sudden stratospheric warming, which has pushed it down towards us. Um, so that's likely to go away and it will probably try to retreat back to the north. Uh, we do notice that so far, so good as far as drought goes. Um, they are predicting drought may occur in South Georgia and Alabama and in Florida. Again, that's large, in large part based on uh, returning to a typical La Nina conditions. And the drought in Alabama is expected to go away pretty quickly. Um, I'm not sure about Puerto Rico. I haven't looked at the statistics there. So here's the summary of the ag impacts of the outlook. The recent wet conditions have really hindered the field preparation and caused problems in the Carolinas and Virginia. Um, those wet conditions and other uh, weather conditions have also caused disease issues for uh, strawberries, melons, and vegetables. Um, Chill hours are looking good so far for most fruit varieties. Uh, won't be a concern this year as it has been in some of the previous winters. And we really have not seen a typical La Nina winter so far this year, but it may return to a more typical pattern later in the winter. So that's what I've got. And it's my honor to uh, introduce you to one of our, our first special guests, Karen Gleason. And I'm gonna let her introduce herself more talking about the year in review. Thanks, Pam. Appreciate that. Um, yes, my name is Karen Gleason. I'm a meteorologist at the National Centers for Environmental Information located in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, my primary responsibility in the monitoring group is to, um, I'm the lead U.S. author for our State of the Climate Reports. And as such, what we try to do in monitoring is take current weather and place it into historical context. We are sort of the nation's scorekeeper and archive all of the historic um, weather data across the U.S. as well as the globe. So it makes sense that we might have a function in, in trying to um, determine if there are trends and, and how, how recent weather compares to our historical record. So next slide, please. All right, so overall um, in, in 2020, um, the contiguous U.S. experienced its fifth warmest year on record and we, we have 126 years of record for the contiguous US. Um, the average was a little, it was a little above average. As you can see, there weren't a lot of um, cool pockets uh, across the contiguous US. The largest warm anomalies were in the West, the Southwest, the Great Lakes, the Northeast, and the peninsula of Florida. Um, next slide, please. As we look a little closer to home um, in the southeast region, we see the map on the left, which is our average temperature rankings for each state. We saw that Florida ranked second warmest for most of the year 2020. For those of you that have been following it, um, year to date temperatures across Florida were record warm, record warm, record warm, and then December got cold. <laughs> So they ended up second warmest for the year. Um, also, Virginia was second warmest, North Carolina um, third warmest. Um, looking at the time series uh, uh, plot on the right-hand side, we see the Southeast region um, from 1895 to present. Um, for the Southeast, we were second warmest as a region. Um, and you can see the, the final dot in that time series um, and, and the dot preceding that, which was last year or the year before 19 or uh, 2019, which was the warmest year for the Southeast. So in the most recent years, we've been sort of at, in, in our top five-ish um, throughout the 126 year period. So it, it was warm in 2020 and has been warm in recent years. Next slide, please. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, minimum temperatures versus maximum temperatures, because the one thing across the southeast that seems um, pretty clear to me at least 
is that the minimum temperatures are really driving the warmth across the southeast. We saw, um, looking at the state rank map on the right, we saw minimum temperatures, which are often associated with overnight low temperatures across Virginia, both Carolinas and Alabama, were record warmest with Georgia and Florida right behind them a second warmest. The time series plot on the left-hand side shows the, 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 tr the linear trend from 1970 to the present. And we see that six of the seven warmest annual minimum temperature years occurred in the last six years. So um, there's definitely something that's been going on the last handful of years where we seem to be in sort of a new neighborhood. There's not a lot of very interannual inter variability the last you know six years or so. So the minimum temperatures have really been the story across the Southeast as far as the the, the near record to record warmth. Next slide, please. All right, and then just to kind of visualize this a little bit more, this is one of our gridded products we have at NCEI and it compares minimum temperatures to average to maximum temperatures. And you can see that um, in this gridded, five kilometer gridded product, we see a lot of pockets of record warmest for minimum temperatures, much of the Carolinas and Virginia and pockets of Georgia, Florida and Alabama. Um, not so much on the t on the average map in the center and then the map on the right, which is your typical daytime high temperatures on, on average. Um, we even see pockets of near average um, in places. So minimum temperatures are definitely the primary driver with the heat in the southeast during 2020. Next slide, please. All right, so switching gears to precipitation, kind of zooming back out. It was really a tale of two precipitation regimes in 2020, the west very dry, the east much wetter. Um, that was primarily due to a, a pattern that was fairly entrenched throughout the year where we had a ridge in the in the west and it was very warm and very dry. And we had an active weather pattern across the southeast associated with multiple troughs. Um, zooming in closer to home on the next slide, we see across the southeast um, our state rank maps. Um, North Carolina was second warmest or second wettest, Virginia third wettest. Um, for the region as a whole, we had our third wettest year across the southeast. Um, looking at the, uh, the map in the middle, which is our gridded, five kilometer gridded product, we see pockets of record wettest across portions of Alabama, Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina. Um, and then looking at the southeast precipitation time series, we see a lot of interannual variability. And, and like I said before, uh, the Southeast was third wettest. We see a couple of years ago, we had our wettest year that was associated um, with a lot of tropical uh, cyclone activity. It was very wet across the Southeast. A lot of, a lot of state records occurred for um, annual precipitation across the Southeast in um, uh, 2018. Next slide, please. Looking at drought across the southeast, as many of you know, it wasn't uh, as big of a deal for the vast majority of the region. Um, Florida and the tip of, of southern Alabama, coastal Alabama there on the Gulf Coast, um, had, had pockets of, of drought during 2020. The primary period was from about mid-March until early June. The uh, peak of, of the moderate and severe drought, so the D1 plus the D2, occurred in early April um, and was about 17% coverage. And then the graphic on, or the map on the right for April 21st, that was when severe drought or D2 drought was at its highest. And that, that was about 5% of the region. Next slide. For Puerto Rico, um, it, the year began and ended with a little bit of drought, um, but the primary drought season for uh, these islands um, were in June and July. Um, the D2 or severe drought, um, which is the map that I'm uh, showing um, on the right-hand side, uh, peaked at 32% um, of, of the island and 60% in June was the moderate and severe drought, so the, the peak of, uh, in the time series in, in June. Um, so, but, so it was primarily just a summertime um, event and the spring and the fall and most of the rest of the year um, were fairly drought-free. Next slide. All right, the hurricane season, if you haven't been hiding under a rock, you probably have heard that um, we, we, we broke our um, number of named storm record for the Atlantic hurricane basin. Um, 2005 has been the year of record um, with 28 named storms, and this year we had 30. Um, 10 of those named storms impacted the Southeast, so if you could forward just one click here on this slide. 
So I've identified the storms that actually had impacts across the southeast. It doesn't mean that they made landfall, but it means that they traversed over the region and some impacts were identified. And if you want to forward one more, four of those were actually made landfall. So Bertha, Isaias, Sally, and Ada actually crossed over the shoreline in the southeast and click one more, five of those 10 that were identified were also identified as billion dollar disasters across the southeast. So a lot of action regarding the hurricane season and, and its impacts as far as damage are concerned. Next slide. So looking at a map of where our, our landfalling storms um, actually hit, we had a record 12 storms that, that impacted the US coastline, which breaks a 1916 record, which was a nine. Um, for the Southeast proper, Sally, Ada, Bertha, and Isaias actually made landfall across the Southeast. Um, but several of the storms that made landfall across Louisiana did kind of curve up and around and have impacts that um, were felt across the Southeast. Next slide. Tornadoes across the US as a whole were a little bit below average, but for the most part across the South and the Southeast, it was a very active season. Um, the most notable event of the year was the uh, super outbreak of April 12th and 13th, where we had 140 tornadoes reported from Texas all the way up to Maryland. It unfortunately was the deadliest outbreak since April of 2014. We had 23 fatalities associated with this outbreak. Also, I wanted to mention that with Hurricane Isaias, um, there were some somewhat rare strong EF2 and EF3 tornadoes reported up the um, North Carolina coastline and into Virginia um, and the mid-Atlantic coast. Um, it, it's not uncommon for tornadoes to be associated with hurricanes, but to have strong tornadoes associated is a little bit more unusual. And there was an EF3 confirmed near Windsor, North Carolina associated with Isaias. Next slide. And um, talking a little bit more about the super outbreak from April 12th and 13, um, there's a breakdown of how many of each um, strength or intensity of tornado were actually verified. And I also wanted to mention that um, in South Carolina, in the low country, there was an EF4 reported, and it is the first EF4 um, on record for the low country, and also the first EF4 since 1995. So it's been a really long time since we've had a, a tornado that intense in um, South Carolina and certainly in, in the coastal parts. But really severe and really deadly and dangerous tornadoes did traverse the Alabama, Georgia, uh, South Carolina area during this event. Next slide. And um, the last uh, slide uh, to talk about is our uh, billion dollar disasters. In 2020, we had a total of 22 across the US. Um, that had losses exceeding $1 billion each. Uh, this shattered the previous annual record of 16 events that occurred in 2011 and in 2017. Across the Southeast, we had a total of 14 such events. Of, of those 22, nine of them were from severe weather and five were from tropical cyclones, including Ada, Zeta, Delta, Sally, and Isaias. The total uh, amount of damage um, across the southeast was about 37.7 billion, which is about 40% of the total assessed losses during 2020. Next slide. And so just quickly to recap, 2020 was really a year of extremes, not only across the US, but across the southeast. The southeast was second warmest and driven mostly by the minimum temperatures. We were also third wettest. Drought was not as big of an issue, but mostly impacted Florida and uh, in, in the spring and early summer, Puerto Rico during the summer. Four tropical cyclones did make landfall across the southeast, including Bertha, Isaias, Sally, and Ada. The super outbreak of April 12th, 13th um, was the largest tornado outbreak for the US and had significant in impacts across the southeast. And as I just mentioned, there were $14 billion disasters that impacted the southeast proper. Um, and there were significant losses associated with that. And so next slide. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions or if we want to hold off on questions, but feel free to visit our State of the Climate Reports. The URL is listed there. Or if you have questions you want to take offline with me, feel free to email me. I can get back to you. And, um, but thank you for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. We'd now like to 
introduce our last speaker, um, Kelsey from the National Integrated Drought Information System, to give a, a very brief walkthrough, a new updated tool that could be very useful to help monitor and track drought conditions in your area. So Kelsey, I am going to go ahead and give you control. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm assuming you all can see my screen with the new drought.gov. Kelsey, do you have control? Yes, I do. Meredith, um, are you able to see my screen? I do not see your screen yet. Okay, that's weird. Um, I, I see the drought.gov website. Okay, you do? Great. Um, it, it says that it's showing my main screen on here. Um, so I'm assuming I'm assuming that that's the case for most people. Um, if, if others of you cannot see it, please please let us know. But otherwise, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Kelsey Settolino, and I work with Unitas. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you the redesigned U.S. Drought Portal or Drought.gov. Um, which we launched in January of this year. And I wanna take just the next five minutes or so to show you some of the key new features of drought.gov um, and how it can be useful for you um, in monitoring drought in your region. So the first key new feature of drought.gov that I wanna show you is the ability to view drought information down to the city and county level. So on the new website, you can enter your zip code or city, and it will take you to a page where you can view drought conditions for your specific location. Um, the maps and charts on these pages are uh, mostly interactive. Um, they're updated automatically, showing current conditions, key indicators of drought, um, forecasts and outlooks, and historical drought conditions at the county level, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a second. Um, it's really easy to zoom out to a slightly larger geographic scale, depending on what you're working with. So, for example, here is the drought conditions page for Wilcox County, Alabama. Um, again, these pages contain um, some quick statistics, interactive maps. Um, you can zoom in or out of most of the maps. It's easy to click on a different county to jump to that county's location page. Um, and, and these pages show, again, current conditions impacts of drought on different economic sectors like agriculture, water supply, and public health, um, as well as future can, and historical conditions about drought for your specific region. And I do want to call out that we have the ability for you to sign up for email alerts when the U.S. Drought Monitor category changes for your location, and, and you can easily sign up for those alerts to get notified when that changes. Our by location section, the goal is that you should be able to view drought conditions, whether it's future conditions, past conditions, or current conditions, at whatever geographic scale you're looking, you're working with, from the city and county level to across the globe. So you can view drought conditions and curated resources for your specific state or for the region as a whole. This is the page for our Southeast Drought Early Warning System, um, which contains uh, upcoming events, including the next Southeast Climate Monthly webinar, ongoing activities supporting drought early warning in the region, and a curated list of resources, data maps, tools, and documents to help you monitor, predict, and plan for drought specifically focused on the Southeast. Uh, the next key feature of drought.gov that I want to talk to you about are the interactive data and maps um, that display data in new ways. Um, and make drought information really easy to access and share. So in our data and map section, you can browse this information by topic. So I'm gonna take a quick look at our historical information page as an example. So if you want to know how a current drought or current abnormally dry conditions compare to historical conditions for your specific region, this historical drought page can help. 
Um, this page displays three different historical drought data sets side by side um, with a really interactive map and chart. So we've got the US drought monitor as one measure of drought going back to the year 2000, a standardized precipitation index um, as another measure of drought that goes back to 1895, and paleoclimate data, which takes tree ring reconstructions combined with instrumental data to estimate the average drought conditions each summer going back to the year zero for some regions of the US. Um, it's really easy to toggle this cursor to select a specific time period, click on a state, for example, Georgia here, to load that state's historical drought information. Um, and all of this information will update. You can even dive down to the county level. Um, once you've found what you're looking for, it's really easy to share this map. And this download a screenshot of the map feature is present throughout the drought.gov website. We're trying to make it really easy to share the information that you find. The final feature that I wanna show you is our brand new by sector section, which shows droughts impacts on different economic sectors. Um, so for example, this is our agriculture sector page. And each of these pages contains um, featured maps uh, related to that sector and key statistics that are all updated automatically and again, easily shareable, key issues related to drought in that sector, as well as a more in-depth background on drought's impacts on that economic sector. Finally, we've got another curated list of resources um, for drought early warning in that sector, trying to make it really easy to have a, a one-stop shop for the drought information that you need. So overall, whether you're looking for drought information by topic, uh, by economic sector that's impacted, or by geographic location down to the city or county level, um, we've created the redesigned drought.gov to help you easily find and share the information you need to help your community better prepare for and mitigate the impacts of drought. You can explore the new website for yourself at www.drought.gov. And with that, I will give the screen back to Merida. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, and also thank you to all of the presenters who joined us today. We really appreciate your time and your effort in um, synthesizing the information and communicating it so well to the Southeast region. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we have a few already um, related to any of the anything that you heard today or other questions related to climate in the Southeast, please go ahead and enter that into the question box and we will respond. Our next webinar will be on March 9th with a special presentation on spring flood outlooks. A webinar, a survey will pop up at the end of this webinar. It's just a few questions. If you haven't taken it before, if you have, please feel free to provide us suggestions on how to improve this webinar series or contact me directly with my email listed here. And with that, we'll move forward to our question time. Our first question is for Karen. Is it safe to say we are seeing warming trends on the lows and not the high temperatures or also the highs? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the slope of the trend for the overnight low temperatures is steeper than that of the daytime temperatures. There is, I didn't have a graphic showing the linear trend for um, maximum temperature or typically daytime highs, but there is a, an upward trend in daytime high temperatures. It's not as um, dramatic as the overnight lows, which is why I said the primary driver for our near record warmth and record warmth in parts of the Southeast is from those minimum temperatures or typically your overnight lows. But you, we are seeing a trend in both. It's just steeper in those overnight temperatures. Great, thank you. Do any of our other panelists uh, would like to reply? Okay, it looks like the rest of our, oh no, we have one more question for Karen. And the idea of the mechanism behind increasing minimum temperatures with less increase in maximum temperatures. So why are we seeing this trend? So um, in a warming world, 
we anticipate, um, of course, seeing increases in temperatures. Um, but as temperatures increase, we also know that the air has the capacity to hold more moisture. When you hold more moisture, um, it, it can increase cloud cover, um, meaning that you know you may not have as many clear nights. If there's more precipitation, the air is more saturated, and so it won't cool off as much at night. So basically, what we're seeing is you know a, a cycle where it, an increase in temperatures, even slight, also increases, like I said, our capacity to hold moisture. So it's like having a blanket at night um, that helps keep the insulation in so that we don't cool off nearly as fast. So that's why we're seeing minimum temperatures respond um, more steeply um, uh, than our daytime high temperatures, even though both overnight and daytime temperatures are increasing. They're just increasing at different rates. Great, thank you. And another question for you, Karen, and this is perfect. Um, it's related to the new 30-year normals that will be coming out. Um, and you may want to take a moment and explain that, what that is to, to the audience. And the question is, how will climate information be more clearly explained when the new 30-year normal range comes into effect? In other words, the future departures from normal may not be as dramatic as they appear now. So it's a great question. One of the things in monitoring that we do intentionally is we compare to a 20th century base period. And the intention behind that is that when the 30 year normals shift, um, when, we talk, when we're comparing what's happening now to what happened several decades ago, we can compare apples to apples. Um, if, you, if, you, if you use the 30 year normals, and, and we anticipate sometime in May, some of at least the first release of the new 30 year normals that will encompass data up through 2020 um, to be released. Um, of course, we're, we're looking to move into a warmer 30 year period. So we're gaining, we're gaining probably the warmest decade we've seen in, in any recent memory and we're, we're losing a slightly less warm period on, on the tail end. So the, the overall impact, if you're, if you're trying to compare new normals to old normals is that things might look, the recent weather might look less extreme. So I think it's just important that you use the right kind of baseline or averaging period for the right kind of analysis you're doing. Certainly there are sectors that only are interested in what's happened in the more recent past because it impacts um, the, the more recent weather is, is more critical to the decisions that they need to make. They're not as interested as what happened in the early 20th century, but from a climate perspective, we're, we're gonna try and continue to use the 20th century as a baseline for our historical comparisons so that it doesn't give the perception that we're, you know, things look cooler than perhaps they, they might otherwise. So it's a great question. It, I think the bottom line is just, you gotta make sure you use the right baseline for the right application, but certainly the new 30 year normals temperature wise will be coming from the warmest 30 year period that, that we've seen in recent memory. Thank you, we have a, a suggestion that this warming trend is something that we should continue to emphasize and highlight in future uh, presentations. So thank you for that, Karen. We also have several comments on the new drought.gov website that they're very pleased and um, with how it's looking, even though there's no current drought um, and there hasn't been some serious drought in a little bit, we all know that it will come back. So this will help us be more prepared in terms of early warning information and informing future planning. And I think that's all for our questions today. And so with that, again, thank you very much to all of our speakers and hope to see all of you next month for our next webinar and have a wonderful day. Thank you.